It was Mother's Day, May 13, 1984, a warm spring afternoon near Tampa, Florida. After spending time with their moms, two boys raced off to fly parachutes made from plastic bags. It was the perfect way to spend a Sunday. But soon, the wind brought a foul smell. They went off to investigate and found a site they would remember for the rest of their lives. In 1984 in South Florida, a rapist and murderer was on the loose. The killer was a ruthless and terrifying predator, the newest member of an infamous group known as serial killers. He kills just for the sake of it. And though his acts at first seem random, his choice of victims is fiercely selective. A woman's occupation, or even her hairstyle, may be enough to make her a target. It takes time at least two kills before the pattern emerges. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The serial killer's world is a delicate balance. On one side is the threat of capture. On the other is his overwhelming need to publicize his crime. Our job is to use everything at our disposal to tip the balance in our favor. What the boys found was the body of a nude woman lying in the roadside weeds. The medical examiner determined she'd been there for about three days. Her wrists were bound behind her back, and a rope with a trailing extension was tied around her neck like a leash. Bruises, blisters, and insects covered her body. But it was the position of the corpse that told detectives this was not a typical murder case. Major Gary Terry, then Lieutenant Terry, had just been appointed head of the Hillsborough County Major Crimes Unit when he got the call. Well, the unique thing about the, the body to me was the fact that her legs were spread about five foot, five foot one inches apart from heel to heel. Uh, a scene that I'll never forget and, and a scene that I've never seen before. The pose was so grotesque, the body seemed to have been positioned that way deliberately. Had the killer meant to shock whoever found it? Crime scene technicians photographed the body and measured its distance from the road. They carefully packaged what little evidence was left, some cloth tied in a knot. Detective Pops Baker of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department also found tire tracks. He worked that night to make plaster casts. Tire casts can reveal the make and size of tires to help experts deduce the size and type of car a criminal is driving. They can also link him to a crime scene. Meanwhile, the body was brought to the medical examiner's office with the ligatures in place for him to study and photograph. The medical examiner determined the victim had been raped, then strangled to death. The brutality of the crime brought a sense of urgency to the investigation. Fearing this would not be an isolated case, Lieutenant Terry immediately contacted the FBI's forensics lab in Washington, D.C. Terry had a detective hand carry the evidence to the FBI lab. He had learned during an earlier case that doing so expedited the processing of evidence and brought the FBI in as an immediate active partner. The 
the FBI lab is one of the foremost forensics laboratories in the country. There are experts on every type of evidence, from bullets to fibers to vehicle parts to nuts. The FBI's knot expert analyzed the ligatures from the tamper victim's wrists and throat. They had been removed intact in hopes they'd tie the killer to his deed. They might also say something about his past. Specialized knots might reveal that he had been a merchant marine or in the military. But the ligatures turned out to be tied in granny knots, simple, functional knots that anyone might have tied. An FBI fiber expert analyzed the fabric found near the body. He brushed particles from the cloth onto a sterile sheet. What traces had the killer left behind? The analyst scanned the particles with a magnifier, but he didn't expect to find much. Such evidence is easily lost through weather or other contamination of the crime scene. In fact, the rule of thumb for fiber evidence is in four hours, 80% is lost. In 48 hours, it's 96%. After three days, the chance of finding anything is almost nil. So he was amazed when he found a small speck of red nylon fiber. It was trilobal, meaning it consisted of three lobes and had a lustrous or shiny coating. From its size, type, and shape, he guessed it was a carpet fiber, maybe from the killer's car. The fact that it was there at all was a minor miracle. The analyst from the FBI lab told the Hillsborough detectives to keep the discovery secret. If this were a serial killer, publicizing fiber evidence could make him change his pattern or his vehicle so he'd be harder to find. The FBI's tire lab also scored. From the tire casts, they determined the tires were of two different brands. All were well-worn and mounted reversed with the black walls facing out. An irregularity like that could be powerful incriminating evidence. Back in Tampa, police identified the victim from her fingerprints the day after her body was found. She was Lana Long, a 20-year-old Laotian woman, a popular exotic dancer in Tampa's red light district. Her boyfriend had recognized her from a newspaper photo and had called police. He became the prime suspect. Officers questioned the girls on the strip, but received no information implicating the boyfriend or anyone else. They were stopped. OK, uh, I'll meet you up here at the tape. And, uh, then, just two weeks later, the calm of another holiday weekend was broken. On Memorial Day Sunday, Detective Pops Baker and Lieutenant Gary Terry of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office were called to a second murder scene, again in an isolated rural area off an interstate. Uh, young female, late 18, 19, 20 range. Like Lana Long, this victim was female, in her late teens to early 20s, and nude. She was also bound at the hands and throat and had a knot at her neck with a leash-like extension. But this knot was different. It was a hangman-style noose. I can remember driving all the way to the crime scene and saying to myself, please don't let this victim be bound. In 1984, we very rarely had homicide victims bound. That's the first thing I asked the officer protecting the crime scene when I drove up. Is she bound? And he said, yes, sir, she is. So we've gone from very rarely having victims bound to two within two weeks. 
So we knew we had a problem. This woman had not been dead long. She's still warm. Because the crime scene was fresher than the last, more evidence remained. Detectives found a man's olive green t-shirt and some strands of hair, which they determined were not the victims. Hanging from a bush a few feet away from the woman's head were her white pantyhose and white jumpsuit, both covered with blood. From the brutality of her wounds, detectives knew she had fought for her life and that it had been a savage struggle. She had been raped, strangled, beaten, and her throat had been cut almost from ear to ear. The medical examiner reported three causes of death, asphyxiation, head injuries, and a lacerated throat. As before, Baker found tire tracks. Casks were taken for analysis and comparison to the ones found at the first murder scene. Once again, the crime scene evidence was hand-delivered to the FBI lab in Washington. Analysts found the same red, lusted trilobal carpet fibers as at the first scene. And this time, there were red trilobal delustered fibers too, with the shiny coating absent. It said fiber evidence is the silent witness, but this match seemed to scream that the cases were linked. Lana Long's boyfriend could not be tied to the second murder, and he was cleared as a suspect. The items found at the scene also provided other clues. The green t-shirt was a size large, suggesting a person of medium build and chest size. The head hairs were medium brown, from a male Caucasian. These two pieces of information began a physical evidence profile, which are shared with other law enforcement agencies. FBI tire expert Sandy Wersema analyzed the tire impressions and made another match. The tracks were the same as those from the first murder scene. Now she knew the position of each tire on the car and that they were mounted on a mid-sized vehicle. The advantage of having a cast over the photograph is that I can actually pick the cast up, I can light it from different angles and different directions, and hopefully if there are any cuts or nicks or um, rocks that are caught in the tire, I'll be able to see that in the cast. But perhaps the best clue came from what she didn't know. She knew two of the tires with a common Goodyear Viva brand, but a third wasn't on the FBI's extensive reference list. One of the tire impressions they could not identify from their files. But what they did was gave us the name of a tire expert, a manufacturer out in Akron, Ohio. And we actually flew a detective, Corporal Baker flew out there personally with the tire impressions, met with the old salts out there at the, the tire factory, and they actually were able to identify that tire force. And that was the Vogue tire and in 1984 was a handmade tire that comes as standard equipment on Cadillacs. We had never even seen a tire like that before. Police were told that if they found the car with that tire, mounted black walls out, okay. it would be as positive an ID as a fingerprint. Analysis of the victim's knife wound revealed that the killer had a knife with a three-inch blade. Now we've got two victims, both bound and both connected forensically. So we knew we had a serial killer on our hands at that time. It's just a gut feeling that I got it. Lieutenant Terry began to track the killer's strikes on a map, hoping they'd reveal a pattern of behavior. He put out the word to patrol officers, look for a white male with brown hair of medium build, driving a mid-sized car with the tires reversed. He may be carrying a knife with a three-inch blade. Following the FBI's recommendation, Terry didn't mention the fiber evidence or the ligatures. 
from a composite drawing released to the media, the second victim was identified. 22-year-old Michelle Sims had a criminal history of prostitution. She'd been reported missing the day before. A key member of the Hillsborough County investigative team was Detective Randy Latimer. At this point, though, we realized we're dealing with a serial killer that it looked like he was uh, probably uh, preying on prostitutes. So uh, we went out into to the areas of the known prostitute areas and then started contacting the girls and, and letting them know what was going on, giving them our business cards that if they saw something strange to contact us, let us know. We're looking for information. We were frustrated that we couldn't, we couldn't get any leads. We couldn't get anything to go on. Then on June 24th, another Sunday, Terry, Baker, and Latimer responded to a third murder scene. A worker had found a body in an orange grove. It was another female. But the pattern seemed different. This one was fully clothed and there were no ligatures, so there was no reason to believe it was linked. Well, as you can see. But detectives didn't rule it out. Looks like it's been undisturbed for quite some time. They delivered the victim's clothing to the FBI lab, just in case a connection could be found. This time, the fiber expert they had worked with before was not available, and someone else was assigned. He wasn't asked to compare the new evidence to the old, so he didn't. Nor did he begin the analysis immediately. The body was so badly decomposed, it only weighed 25 pounds, including clothes. It took some time to get an ID. And when it finally came, the victim's lifestyle didn't fit the pattern either. 22-year-old Elizabeth Ludenbach of Tampa was a shy assembly line worker who lived with her family. She had no criminal history and was not a prostitute, although she did frequent bars on Tampa's Strip. A note in Elizabeth's room said to find her boyfriend if anything happened to her. So detectives ordered a polygraph test. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You just need to answer yes or no to those questions. Do you understand? Yeah. Did you know Elizabeth Luden back? Yes. Did you have a relationship with Elizabeth Ludenbeck? Yes. Did you ever harm Elizabeth Ludenbeck? No. He failed the polygraph test, making him the prime suspect. Yeah, it wasn't until mid-September Three months oh, really? after the discovery of Elizabeth's body in the That's Orange Grove, that the results That's came great. in. Yeah? The FBI had a match. Yeah? They found That's red fantastic. carpet fibers identical to those found in the first two murders. Looks like Ludenbeck is ours. They Good. found red fibers that connected up. Now they had three related killings. Terry entered the new scene Jump on the, the map. Any kind of significant difference? Every detective on the homicide squad was working the case. The nature of the investigation began to change. Instead of focusing on boyfriends and neighbors, detectives pursued an unknown killer terrorizing the women of Tampa. We've taken the entire homicide unit now, are concentrating on these cases, and we're running down leads, we're getting telephone calls about different people, and we're checking those leads out. We're doing a background investigation of, of these particular victims, and we're coming up empty. And all we have to do is Unfortunately, wait, and then there's another victim is discovered. And that is victim number four.
After a lull of more than three months, the calm of yet another Sunday was shattered. On October 7th, a worker found a body near the entrance to the K-Bar Ranch in Northern Hillsborough County. This time, Detective Steve Cribb was assigned to help process the scene. He, Terry, Baker, and Latimer didn't have to look far for the first grim piece of evidence. The victim's bra hanging from the entrance gate. The nude body of a young black woman was nearby. Her clothing was beside her. Most of the detectives ruled her out as a serial victim. She had been raped, but unlike the others, she had been shot, not strangled, and there were no ligatures. Also, she was African-American, and usually serial killers don't cross racial boundaries. Get her into a controlled environment, we'd be able to really... While the FBI analyzed the evidence, detectives identified the victim from fingerprints. 18-year-old Chanel Devon Williams had just recently been released from jail on a prostitution arrest when she disappeared. She was last seen working the red light district along Nebraska Avenue with a friend, another prostitute, a few days before. She had been dead about six days. The FBI's hair and fiber analysis revealed it was the work of the serial killer. Both types of red fibers were found on Chanel's clothing, along with a brown Caucasian pubic hair. By crossing racial bounds and using a different weapon, the killer had changed his routine. Shifting from a pattern is very rare in serial killers and would make this one more difficult to capture. Chanel was added to the map near the Pasco Hillsborough County line. With four dead, detectives were desperate to find the killer and obsessed with the case. You don't work these cases. You live and breathe these types of cases. You go home at night, you dream about this case. You eat and sleep it. I would go home at night and just look at the telephone, waiting for it to ring. Every Sunday, for some reason, the first series of bodies were discovered on Sunday. On Sunday, I didn't plan anything. I sat at home. Indeed, the Sunday after Chanel's body turned up, Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb were called to another murder scene. This one was near Lake Thanodasasa, northeast of Tampa. A couple of amateur archaeologists had uncovered a morbid find. At the side of the road was a woman's body, wrapped in a gold-colored bedspread, tied with a blue jogging suit. Thank you. Inside, her lower legs and ankles were bound with common white string. Her hands were tied in front of her with a red bandana. She had been bound, raped, strangled, hit on the forehead, and dragged through the dirt. It seemed the killer was back to his old pattern. The woman was quickly identified from fingerprints as 28-year-old Karen Din's friend. Raised in an affluent suburban household, she had died a drug-ravaged prostitute. She was last seen alive in the early hours of the day she was killed. As if there weren't enough to link the killer to the crime, investigator Steve Cribb actually saw red trilobal carpet fibers on Karen's body. By now, he developed a sixth sense for them. When you know what you're looking for, they almost look like glow worms on the, on the victims. But for the average person to walk up and find them, even the other investigators who weren't looking for this type, they wouldn't see them but uh, they became such a key point of the investigation that when we went to a crime scene, that's one of the first things we would look for with the carpet fibers. At the FBI lab, the fiber expert compared these fibers to the ones from the other crime scenes. They matched. There were now five cases linked to a single killer, but there was still no name, no face, 
and no one under arrest. It becomes very frustrating that you know someone else is going to die because you haven't stopped the suspect. Um, you have enough information to know that he's doing it, but not enough information to pick him out of the crowd if he were to bump into you walking down the mall. Because you have to remember in this series of cases, our concern is if we don't stop this guy, if we don't find him today, he's going to kill somebody tomorrow or the next day. And when in fact he did. Two weeks later on Halloween, another victim emerged. A contractor digging a ditch found the mummified remains of a woman's body. Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb arrived at the scene. The medical examiner estimated the body had been there for about a month. The body was badly decomposed. An ID would require special measures. The FBI lab needed to soften the skin on the hands in order to get fingerprints. As hard as the victim was to identify, detectives instantly recognized the killer. The body had been completely mummified. The head had been separated by animal activity. Uh, there were no ligatures attached, no clothing. And again, you just look at the body and you realize it's him again. You just have that feeling by now of the crime scenes, of seeing body after body after body, that it should be the same killer. And in fact, it was. Then at 7.30 a.m., on Sunday, November 4th, a call came in to Tampa police that seemed unrelated. A man reported his daughter had been abducted and raped. Seventeen-year-old Lisa McVeigh was leaving work at a Krispy Kreme donut shop on her bicycle. It was around 2.30 a.m. A man snatched her off her bike, threw her into his car, and drove off. He held her at gunpoint, reclined her seat so no one would see her, and told her to remove all of her clothes. <laughs> he took her to his apartment, bound and gagged. She'd been sexually abused before, and she knew how to read the moods of an abuser. Lisa sensed resistance might send this man into a rage. So she quietly did what he wanted. Lisa memorized all she could about her surroundings. At first, she peeked out from beneath her blindfold. Then when he uncovered her eyes, she saw everything, including his face. She was certain that now he'd never let her leave alive. He took her to his bedroom and repeatedly raped her for 24 hours. Sometimes he slept, but she knew he was armed and that he'd kill her if she tried to leave. After a full day of captivity, the man told Lisa to take a shower. Then he gave her some clothes and made her a sandwich. To her amazement, he said he would take her home. At around 3 a.m., they drove toward her neighborhood. On the way, he stopped at a 24-hour teller machine to withdraw money to get gas. Peeking under her blindfold, Lisa continued to memorize details. The Howard Johnsons, road signs, the word Magnum on the dashboard of his car. He 
finally released her near her home. After Lisa's adoptive father reported the abduction, Hallie. she was interviewed Hallie. by Tampa police officers. I want to ask you everything that happened um, the night when you left work, and I'm going to record you. They were amazed by her almost total recall and fierce resolve to catch the rapist. Well, um, I always leave work about 12 o'clock. I got on my flight. Although Lisa had not been killed, there were many similarities to the Hillsborough cases. The abduction, the rape, the man's build and hair color, and even the red interior of his car. Tampa police sent Lisa's sweater to the FBI lab. We were inundating the FBI lab with things to compare for fiber samples, rape cases, assault cases, anything sexually related, any violent crime, we were sent to the FBI lab for a fiber comparison. Meanwhile, just a week after the last body was found, Pasco County detectives were called to another murder scene. On November 6th, 1984, a woman's body was found on the same road as the fourth victim, Chanel Williams. Only this time it was to the north, in neighboring Pasco County. Pasco detectives called Hillsborough detectives to a vacant lot near a mobile home park. If you look right here. The body was in a different county, but the ligatures and fibers were all too familiar. Although the body had decomposed to mainly bones, the telltale leash was still attached around the neck. A little bit of shoelace, right around there. There was another ligature on an arm bone. Near the body were the woman's tattered blouse and panties and some jewelry. The bones were scattered over almost an acre. When the medical examiner pieced them together, they seemed to belong to a young, white female. She was later identified as 18-year-old Virginia Johnson. Ginny divided her time between Connecticut and Florida, where she worked as a prostitute. She disappeared on her way to buy cigarettes about three weeks earlier. After all that time, it seemed impossible but the FBI lab found a single red, lustrous fiber in Jenny Johnson's hair. Within the week on November 12th, another jurisdiction fell prey to the killer. A body was found on an incline off North Orient Road within Tampa city limits. When Terry and Baker arrived, they found a young white woman, nude but for knee-high stockings. She was face down. When they turned her over, police knew from her bloodied face that she had been savagely beaten and that she had struggled. There were ligature marks on the front of her neck and on both wrists and arms, but no rope was found. Her wadded up blue jeans and flowered top were near her body. Detectives Baker and Cribb immediately saw something stuck to the blue jeans, tiny red fibers. In the pocket of the jeans was the victim's driver's license. Kim Marie Swan was a 21-year-old part-time student who sidelined as an exotic dancer. She was last seen leaving a convenience store near her parents' home the previous afternoon. It seemed the killer had pulled off the road and thrown the body out of his car. There were faint tire impressions in the grass near the roadway. They would match the casts made earlier. The killer was picking up the pace of his killings, and the body count stood at eight. Terry and Baker were desperate. They drove to Atlanta to meet with a detective who helped crack the case of Wayne Williams, a serial killer believed to be responsible for 27 murders. Because something we didn't really want to share publicly in 1984, what do you do when you're 10 bodies, 15, or 20 bodies down, and you don't have the suspect in custody? What do you do? We were sitting down in their office discovering. And during the course of that conversation, the telephone rang. And it, the, the telephone call was from the FBI in Washington. And the FBI lab says, we have just had a match on a piece of fiber evidence 
submitted from a rape case. And I was blindfolded. That case turned out to be the abduction and rape of Lisa McVeigh only a week earlier. um, Tampa police had rushed Lisa's clothing to the FBI lab, and experts there had found matching red trilobal carpet fibers on her sweater. It was the break they'd been waiting for. Terry flew back to Tampa immediately. He formed a task force of officers from the Hillsborough and Pasco County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the FBI, along with the Tampa police detectives already working the rape case. Then he divided them into teams, each with a different assignment. They initiated a massive manhunt. Patrol cars fanned out across North Tampa. They were looking for the killer's apartment and his red Dodge Magnum. The information from Lisa McVeigh is their roadmap. The additional personnel and resources brought in by the task force stepped up the search for Lisa McVeigh's abductor. Because the perpetrator used an ATM, one team of investigators subpoenaed the November 4th bank records for all local automatic teller machines. Another team subpoenaed a select list of all the Dodge Magnums in Hillsborough County, almost 500 cars. Then they compared the bank records and the list of Magnum owners looking for a name that matched. And the unique thing when you looked at both lists is that one name jumped out at you is Robert Joe Long. He had a money transaction from the money teller machine, early morning hours. He also was a registered owner of a Dodge Magnum. In addition, earlier that day, a task force team from Tampa spotted a red Dodge Magnum on Nebraska Avenue, the killer's hunting ground. The detectives stopped the car. They told the driver they were looking for a robbery suspect. From his license, they identified him as Robert Joe Long. They photographed him and wrote up a field report. He was cooperative, but wouldn't let them search his car. Uh, Of course, they contacted the task force uh, headquarters uh, when they made the stop, and we told them, go ahead and stay with it at that particular time, stay with the car once it left, and, and we put a surveillance team together then to stay on him. At that time, a photo pack was assembled, a lineup of photographs, in which he was placed in that photo pack. That photo pack was shown or displayed to Lisa. She looked at it and said, that's the guy that kidnapped me. She pointed out Bobby Joe Long. Lieutenant Terry had his man, but he couldn't risk making a mistake with a quick arrest. He needed time to obtain warrants and organize his team. To ensure public safety, Terry ordered nonstop surveillance of Long. Units followed Long's every move in unmarked cars. Maybe he sensed they were on his trail because he started cleaning house. Officers cleaned up right behind him. Even when he vacuumed his car, police seized the vacuum. They retrieved everything Long thought he was destroying. After months of tracking a phantom killer, the task force was not about to let him slip away. Less than 24 hours after Lisa McVeigh identified Bobby Joe Long, the arrest plan was firmly in place. The task force moved in. They had followed Long to a movie theater. I'm right over here, Stewie. As he watched the film, undercover detectives watched him. Long seemed unaware he was surrounded. We're sitting at the war room we had constructed down at the operations center, we're heading, and everything is just going 90 miles an hour. We have a surveillance team on the inside of the theater watching it. There's a surveillance team outside watching the car. And that nagging doubt comes to you. Is this really the guy you've been chasing for eight months? Is this really the guy that you has been killing these women? So we tell the surveillance team outside, listen, whatever you do, get up to his car. I don't care if you have to low crawl, whatever you have to do, get to the car and tell us what kind of tires are on the car.
And the surveillance team came back and said, hey, there's, there's Goodyear Beaver tires on the car. They're all black wall. And he said, there's some oddball tire here named Vig Vogue, something like that on the car. As Soon as he said that, we knew. When we pulled up and saw the car, saw the tire, the Vogue tire that had been described from one of our uh, tire impressions, when we saw the seat that, were, that revolved, that, that laid back, the red carpet fiber, there wasn't a doubt in our mind that we had the right suspect. Terry gave the order to arrest. Detectives followed long as he left the field. He was never out of their sight. They didn't know if he was armed, so as he approached his car, they jumped him and brought him to the ground. He didn't resist. He was on the ground when I walked up to him and placed my badge next to his face and identified myself as a deputy sheriff, advising him he was under arrest. They took Long's car to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's office garage. Steve Cribb immediately tore out a piece of carpeting and rushed it to an FBI fiber expert flown in from Washington. Meanwhile, Randy Latimer and members Good. of the task force interviewed Bobby Joe yeah. Long, who had declined his right to an attorney. I heard when they arrested you out on the street that you got some uh, cuts and stuff on your hands and arms. Did they take care of all that for you? Oh, yeah. Okay. They were well prepared, having consulted the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy on how to conduct the interview. Detective Price. Um, just where you want to start. The game plan was to start by addressing only Lisa McVeigh. Long confessed immediately. Well, I uh, went down there and uh, partner fired. After, after he admitted to the rape and abduction of Lisa McVeigh, we talked about uh, why he let her go uh, and, and what went through his mind and what went on. Um, I, I rolled into questioning him about uh, prostitutes. Have you ever picked up any prostitutes? Um, he told me he had in Miami. I asked him about here. Um, and, and he said, well, he might have. Then they began talking to him about the murders. He initially denied it, committing any of the murders. As the interview continued, the FBI fiber expert examined the carpet from Long's car. He compared this sample to the others. It was the moment of truth. As soon as they looked, put them on the comparison microscope, the FBI agent called back and said, bingo, it's a match. The carpet fiber from the car matches the carpet fiber from the different homicide scenes. Um, to me at this point. Excuse me. Terry told Latimer the news. Then Latimer explained it to Long. I mean, we just got information. He told him about the fibers and their significance, and about Long's brown head hair found at the crime scene, and the Vogue tire. Latimer let Long know that by the time they found the second body, they were already on his trail. Uh, what can I say? The evidence was overwhelming. And he looked. He looked down, he had, his, he had his legs kind of, his knees spread apart, and he looked down between his feet, and I said, yeah, I did it. I said, did what? He says, I killed him. I killed who? He says, I killed all those girls. All those girls in the paper, I killed. Um, and, and then we just started going through them one by one after that. And then it just became more and more. You know, Long described each murder in a taped it, confession. Well, the interview lasted no, five and a half hours. Bobby Long showed know, no emotion, mean, no remorse, uh, it, it, was, it was just a, an everyday conversation like you and I are having here. Yeah. At the end, uh, I don't remember if it was myself or Bob Price had asked him why he did it. And he said that that was his secret and he was going to take it to the grave with him. That's 
During the interview, Long also confessed to a ninth murder. When detectives found her remains, they also found more of the tiny red carpet fibers. The victim was identified through dental records as 21-year-old Vicki Elliott, a waitress. Long also helped identify his sixth victim, whose body had been found on Halloween. 22-year-old Kimberly Hops was known by the street name of Sugar. She was last seen by her boyfriend getting into a maroon Chrysler Cordoba, probably Long's red Dodge Magnum. I'd like to thank the members of the press corps. Late that night, today. Lieutenant Terry called a press conference. The agency task force has for months been investigating a probable serial killer. The media thought police would announce yet another body. County, Pasco County. We have they were shocked by the arrest. How long have you had this suspect? Bobby Joe Long, and he's presently been charged with 10 homicides that have occurred over the course of the past six months within Hillsborough County, Pasco County, and the city of Tampa. He was arrested without incident and has subsequently confessed to several of the homicides under investigation. Do you have evidence for all the homicides? Where did you run yes, Open five. In the coming days, Hillsborough detectives learned they weren't the only ones tracking law. Task Force member Charles Troy, a Pasco County detective, stumbled upon the truth. He realized that Long fit the description of a man who had raped a Pasco woman months ago. Troy scoured Long's apartment for evidence. He found a photo album filled with photographs of nude women, including the rape victim. In jail, Long confessed and bragged about the crime. Detectives had also found clothing and jewelry from Long's other victims. It's a common quirk of serial killers to keep photos or other trophies of those they kill. Detectives soon realized that Long was the classified ad rapist, named for his M.O. He canvassed the classifieds for women selling beds and other furniture, and when they let him in, he brutally raped them. He had never been apprehended. Long may have raped more than 50 Florida women in the 1970s and 80s, some even during his murder spree. Now with Long finally in jail, detectives reflected on lessons learned. It just shows the importance of physical and trace evidence, shows the importance of the cooperation with the laboratory and what they can do for you, and the effort that you have to put at a crime scene. There, the hours you need to spend there, you, don't, you, you can't rush. You just have to be deliberate, take your time, and be professional in what you're doing. Because oftentimes, the answer is sitting right there in front of you. And the smallest speck, the smallest little piece of information may be the one key that breaks this case. Uh, As detectives got ready for the Thanksgiving weekend, they thought the horrifying eight-month string of killings was finally behind them. They packed up the boxes of evidence and hoped some semblance of normalcy would finally return. But even then, a quiet holiday seemed to evade them. On Thanksgiving Thursday, a couple out walking found a skull, bones, and some clothes, as well as three pieces of rope, including a leash-type ligature. But what he really enjoyed was the pain, the torture, and the torment, and the control he exercised over these victims. You can see that in the early crime scenes with, with the leader, the leash-like, attached to their neck, where he choked them out of consciousness. Then the victim wakes up, and he's still there astride her, raping her, torturing her. That's where Mr. Long got his enjoyment, his kicks. Killing, just eliminate a witness. He could do that without any compunction, without any, any trouble at all. When a forensic dentist linked the body to a missing persons report, Long confessed. The victim was Artisan Wick, an 18-year-old bride-to-be who had vanished from a northeast Tampa street corner on March 28th. She had been missing for eight months. Ironically, 
Wick was the first victim taken, though the last one found. She brought the known death toll to 10, but Terry has always believed there were more. I'm confident he's killed other women, other people. Uh, are we gonna find those bodies or discover those other cases? I don't know that we ever will. Bobby Joe Long was never convicted in the classified ad rapes, in part because the statute of limitations had expired by the time he was caught. He did receive six life sentences and 693 years for attacks on women in 1984 and 85. For the Hillsboro murders and the rape of Lisa McVeigh, Long received 33 life sentences. He was sentenced to death for the killings of Virginia Johnson and Michelle Sims. After sentencing, Long left the courthouse whistling a tune. Mr. Long is, is a killing machine. He became very proficient at what he was doing, very skillful at it. And if Mr. Long ever sees the light of day, all you're gonna have to do is follow the trail of his other bodies, of his other victims, because he will kill again. He enjoyed it. Long remains on Florida's death row with no date set for his execution. In 1989, residents of a close-knit apartment community in Virginia gathered for a holiday celebration. For Tammy Brannan and five-year-old daughter Melissa, Christmas was always a special time. Then, without warning, the little girl was gone. Her disappearance ignited an impassioned search. Law enforcement and the local community spared no effort but would they piece together the evidence and find her before it was too late? In 1989, in front of close to 200 witnesses, a child disappeared. Five-year-old Melissa Brennan vanished from a Christmas party at her mother's apartment complex in Virginia. Children have a way of wandering off, but it soon became clear this was more than a case of a lost child. Someone had taken Melissa. What sorrow compares to a mother's grief? What kind of monster preys on children? I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The hunt for Melissa galvanized the community as a nation held its breath and waited for word. All victims deserve justice. All criminals must be punished. But when a crime involves a child, the stakes become so much greater. On December 3rd, 1989, the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton, Virginia held its Yuletide Christmas party. The Woodside was a large but friendly complex, a community that revolved around family life and children's activities. The kids were always excited about the party, which meant special treats and presents. A single mom, Tammy Brannon, had found in the Woodside Complex a safe community in which to raise her only child, Melissa. As the evening wound down, Tammy stopped to visit with a friend before going home. Can I go get some potato chips? Okay, we'll come right back. Okay. She lost sight of her daughter for only a few seconds. But that was long enough for our mother's worst nightmare to begin.
Melissa? Melissa! Melissa disappeared. The Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department was called immediately. Now, I'm going to do everything I can to find your little girl, but you have to tell me everything you can possibly Detective Bill Wilden assured Tammy they would do all they could to find her little girl. The detectives began questioning the people at the party. No one could recall seeing Melissa leave the party or anywhere near the front door. I'm Detective Wilden. This is Rappaport with the Richard Rappaport, the Fairfax Department search commander, joined Detective Wilden to organize the search party. If you come across anything suspicious, an article he would head up the investigation. Does everyone understand? One of the possibilities, of course, there. was that she had just uh, hidden somewhere in the building, was playing with some friends, or had wandered off. So immediately the patrol officers on the scene did a very good job of searching the building, and they began a search of the immediate area surrounding the building. The night of December 3rd was a bitterly cold night in the Washington area. Uh, someone outside that was five years old without a lot of protection probably would not have survived uh, through the night. It was that cold. Outside Rappaport coordinated a more specific grid search of the area with patrol officers and dozens of volunteers from the complex. The search effort began. Nearly a hundred neighbors, police, and army personnel from nearby Fort Belvoir combed the woods around the complex. Most were parents themselves, united by a single concern, to find Melissa. Like the detectives, they expected to find a shivering and frightened little girl lost in the dark woods and crying for her mother. Officers began to question the 200 people who had attended the party and interview over 400 other Woodside residents. Though the complex was large, many residents knew Melissa and knew her to be very shy. Shocked to hear that she had disappeared, almost all expressed doubt that she would ever have gone off without her mother, and certainly not with a stranger. Detective Wilden went with Tammy to her apartment to interview her. He questioned her extensively about her past, and possible troubles with her neighbors or employer. An accountant, she had never had any problems with anyone. Tammy had lived at Woodside for over three years since her divorce from her husband in Texas. She had experienced the normal readjustments of a newly single mom, but she and her ex-husband were on good terms. When detectives discovered an open window in the furnace room, Nobody Jim Gogan, the crime scene investigator for the Fairfax County Police Department, was asked to examine it. The way the door was set up, everybody had to either go through the crowd to get out the front of the building. Uh, that was only the main door and the only door available to get out, uh, with the exception of the, the hallway down to the bathrooms and the furnace room. They had large, uh, large windows, and in, in the furnace room itself had a, a, a window that was discovered open. And from there, the assumption was made that possibly that's how she uh, was taken from the building. Melissa's disappearance was suddenly far more complicated. The search for a missing child had become a possible abduction case. Did you see her leave the party at any time? The police continued their questioning with even greater urgency and began to hear repeated mention of the strange, even bizarre behavior of the maintenance man for the complex. What was his name? Several of the women reported how offended they were by extremely vulgar sexual propositions made to them by Caleb Hughes. There was a possibility that if she had been abducted for sexual purposes that she might be molested, but we were very, very um, hopeful that we could at least find her alive uh, before her life was in jeopardy. Now that they were dealing with a possible abduction case, detectives returned to Tammy's apartment and collected nightgowns, hairbrushes, and bedclothes, any items bearing traces of Melissa. 
Can you describe? As detectives continued questioning the people at the party, they learned more disturbing details about Hugh's behavior that night. He had spent what seemed to many to be an unusual amount of time playing games with the children. He made the parents uneasy by touching the kids. There was something unsettling, something indecent about him. At the party, he was not dressed uh, uh, as well as the rest of the people. He wore his work clothes. Um, he mingled with some of the people he knew at the party, and he spent some time talking with Melissa's mother, uh, making comments about Melissa, and offered to take Melissa and a couple of the other children to the restroom if they needed to go. He just had some very suspicious behavior from a man of his age around the children. With growing suspicion, the detectives tried repeatedly to reach Hughes by phone and then went to his house, but were told by his wife that she had no idea where he might be. Were you playing with her tonight? He had left the party sometime before our arrival there. He lived only four miles away, but it took us several hours for us to contact him because he had not yet returned home. Finally, two and a half hours after Melissa's disappearance, Caleb Hughes called the police, who then returned to his house. Upon questioning, he claimed he had simply taken the long way home. The officers immediately noticed he was wearing different clothing from that reported by witnesses at the party. I washed clothes tonight when I got home. They're in the, they're in the washing machine over there. In the washing machine, they found the clothes Hughes had been wearing, as well as his sneakers and a leather belt with a knife sheath. The knife was missing. You washed your shoes at 2 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. He'd been gone for several hours, and to come home in the middle of the night when your family was asleep, and to feel the immediate need to wash everything you had been wearing, including your shoes, we found that rather suspicious behavior, and that just further added to our our interest in, in his whereabouts. As Hughes appeared reluctant to speak in front of his wife, the officers decided to take him to headquarters for further questioning. Suspecting that Hughes might be covering for time spent with a girlfriend, the officers wanted to allow him the opportunity to tell the real story. Do you know Melissa Brandon? No, I do not. To the detective's surprise, there was no real story. Hughes had no alibi. He claimed he had no idea who Joe. Melissa was, that he had driven the yeah. long way home Why were you washing your after shoes? picking up a six-pack, and then had simply washed his clothes. You normally wash your shoes with your clothes? Sometimes, yeah. What were they dirty with? He said as an excuse that, that were, they were his only work clothes and he had to be to work the next day and they were dirty, so he needed to clean them for work. Look, am I being charged with anything? Despite hours of intense questioning, Hughes remained no, smug and evasive. I'm free to go. Finally, yeah, Detective to go. Wilden told him he was free to go, but I know you're he was almost certain Hughes was lying. Well, you're going to have to prove it then, aren't you? As far as the Fairfax County Police Department was concerned, Caleb Hughes was the prime suspect. Believing Caleb Hughes was involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Wilden contacted Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan. It was a suspected homicide, certainly by then. He made some statements that, that were out of character for somebody who really yeah, is Brandon? a suspect in a uh, crime yeah. of this nature. You would Wait, normally you think the, the minute somebody would suggest you or I have a, a abducted a five-year-old child, I mean, you would think we, it would be the most vigorous, vehement outburst. Of course I didn't. Well, they got nothing like that. Matter of fact, at one point he said to, uh, he said to Wilden, prove it which is, uh, again, a, an unusual reaction for somebody who had nothing to do with it. Gogan had photocopied Melissa's picture and printed hundreds of flyers to help in the search. And as the sun came up, the, the search expanded um, into you know, further down south on the highway. Uh, they sent soldiers out to do uh, massive searches through the woods. 
along the railroad tracks and, and as possible ideas of, of locations where she might have been were developed. Again, um, hundreds of people were, were uh, gathered to search and walk those areas. The car Hughes had been driving that night belonged to his wife. She gave investigators permission to impound and search it. Detectives examined it for fingerprints, blood, fibers, hair, any evidence that would document Melissa's presence there. Fingerprint tests revealed that only the Hughes family had left prints on the car. Next, all the hairs and fibers needed to be collected from the interior. This type of trace evidence was usually retrieved with a vacuum cleaner, but there was simply too much debris inside. When I first approached the car and looked inside, I, I just kind of went, whoa. Uh, they had two large dogs, the Hughes. Um, they carried them a lot in that car. They were, it was just cluttered with dirt and debris and, and just just a mess inside that car. And, and I just kind of shook my head like this was gonna be a, a real challenge. So I decided to, uh, to, to use the masking tape as an alternative to the vacuum cleaner, just hoping to uh, just get what was on the surface. That was an unusual technique, certainly. Um, in, in my years, that was the first time I ever had run into it uh, in the Fairfax uh, Police Department. And uh, it's, it's a very common technique now. Gogan then placed the tape between layers of clear plastic so that it could be examined intact under a microscope. As the car processing continued, Melissa's disappearance quickly became the lead news story in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Melissa Brannan is three feet tall, 48 pounds with blue eyes and dark blonde, shoulder-length hair. She was last seen wearing a pink ski jacket, red plaid skirt, and black shoes with gold buckles. The night of the party, Melissa had been wearing a navy blue acrylic sweater with a Sesame Street Big Bird picture, red tights, a red cotton plaid skirt, and a pink parka. Uh, when I found the red and blue fibers that were visible on the tape, I, I did kind of get uh, excited about that. But at the time, I was excited but worried because we needed to find her to, to identify uh, the clothes, the possible clothes. Without Melissa, that was going to be real tough. When Gogan conducted luminol testing on the interior of Hughes's car, he found traces of blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and floor mat. When a light is shined on the luminol-treated area, blood stains will appear fluorescent. While the luminol process is quite accurate as a blood locator, it can also destroy the genetic characteristics of the sample. When I sprayed the steering wheel, I got the reaction on the steering wheel and as well as on the, on the pedals of the vehicle, that's where the, it, it fell to. Um, these items were swabbed and, and collected. Hughes's shoes had been washed but the lab was able to identify possible blood stains on their soles where fresh cuts had been made. It became very suspicious when I received the clothes from the, the officers who searched the house and noticed that he had uh, cut his tennis shoes. Um, kind, of, kind of putting two and two together that why was he cutting his tennis shoes and why did I get a reaction to blood on the gas bottles? Surely Caleb Hughes had tried to cover his tracks to avoid a link to an unimaginable crime. What is your name? Caleb Hughes. How old are you? With the luminol findings showing blood in his car, the detectives were increasingly confident they could get a confession from Hughes. He was brought in for a polygraph test. He had no explanations for the fresh cuts on his shoes. No. Once again, he gave no explanation for the two hour, 30 minute delay in getting home. But as it turned out, there never was an explanation. He said, I just took the long way home. That was the best they got. Did you harm Melissa Brandon? No. Did you kill Melissa Brandon? No. He's a proven to be deceptive. When Hughes denied outright that he had killed Melissa, Holograph examiner Rick Danielle was sure he was lying. 
he really denied ever having seen this child, that I had known who the child was. He was showing pictures of her. Never seen that child before. And, of course, the police knew that was not true because he had been at the same table with the child, had talked to the child. You got the wrong guy. I'm asking about what you did. Danielle was absolutely satisfied he was hiding something, that uh, he was lying about something. I'm out of here. He was attempting to deceive him. But of course, none of that under Virginia law, uh, as you may know, none of that's evidence. Uh, you're not allowed to use it at trial. Investigators were convinced Hughes had abducted and harmed the beautiful little girl. But Tammy Brennan tried to keep her hope alive, fighting her worst fears. Melissa's Christmas presents waited under the tree. News 7 has confirmed tonight that the investigation into the disappearance of five-year-old Melissa Brannon appears to be focusing on one primary suspect. Police will continue their search efforts and to pursue leads. There is now a $10,000 reward for any information concerning Melissa's whereabouts. For Tammy Brannon and her parents, the hours passed in an agonizing wait for more information. Melissa's disappearance electrified the tiny rural community of Lorton, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Only five months earlier, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been bike riding in her neighborhood when she was abducted, raped, and murdered. Her killer had never been found. Nice to meet you, Rosie's mother quickly came to Tammy Brennan's support. The yellow ribbons that punctuate trees and balconies at the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton have weathered... Once Melissa's disappearance was reported on the news, the community rushed to her support. To yellow ribbons began appearing on Christmas Brannan. trees throughout the area. Uh, by all indications, Tammy was a wonderful mother, a very loving mother, very, very protective of her child. Melissa was her only child, and I, I just think all those facts together struck a chord that virtually anyone could identify with those circumstances, and, and people's hearts went out to the, to the Brannon family. Hundreds of people volunteered to post flyers throughout the region and assist the local authorities in their search. A new expert was also brought into the search effort. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent John Goad, one of their search and rescue consultants. So we are uh, legislated into being as the state clearinghouse for all the information regarding missing persons. And we also assist families and law enforcement, kind of as a liaison between the two, uh, working as many cases as we can. After debriefing, Goad and his partner went directly to the apartment complex clubhouse. Check a stride out here. Outside, they found adult male footprints leading from the furnace room window to a split rail fence whose top rail had recently been broken. We began to find transferences on the other side of the fence into a small parking lot there beside the clubhouse uh, in the parking lot, I think with an abandoned restaurant or some type of building there. And that's where the track stopped. Straight through here, over this fence. Right from the beginning, we found the adult footprints, but we never found the child's footprints. So we felt comfortable that if that was the abductor we were looking for, and we felt pretty comfortable that it was, that Melissa was probably being carried even from out, outside the window, was being carried by the abductor to the point where she, she and the abductor got in the vehicle. But where would Hughes have taken her? I don't know. Detectives received a lucky break when they interviewed Hughes's wife. She had been somewhat suspicious that he might go somewhere else after work. She didn't want him to go anywhere except to work and directly back home. And so unbeknownst to him, she had made a note of what the mileage was. And the following day told us that she had checked the mileage again and that 12 miles had been put on the car. We now had a p another piece of possible information about the extent to which okay, he could have gone that hours? night. We first marked the location of the crime, this was the apartment complex in southern Fairfax County. We next located Caleb Hughes's residence, which was in northern Prince William County, roughly in this area. We then took a string that was the equivalent of 12 linear miles and tied the two ends of the string together and placed them over the pins. So we simply took a pencil 
and defined that area so that any point at the end of that string represented the outer limits of the search that was conducted on December the 8th. Within three days of Melissa Brannon's disappearance, investigators had organized a 25 square mile joint search with the Army, Police Department, Civil Air Patrol, and Coast Guard. Over 500 volunteers turned out for the effort. We have a 12 mile radius that we need to cover. We had dozens of search teams that were comprised of trained law enforcement people, civilian volunteers, and military personnel. They were doing step-by-step -step searches of defined areas. Each area had been broken down and was assigned to a team. We're going to be looking for the clothing a lot. That's going to be one of the main things. They had specific instructions on how to search. If they found anything which they thought might be evidence, they were to mark it, uh, not to disturb it. And we had teams of crime scene people who would then respond to that particular location and process the evidence. At this point, we've not found anything today that puts us any closer than we were this morning. The volunteers were frustrated and extremely disappointed. I know there were nights when I would go home and my family would have seen a newscast about another day of searching and my own children would say, Daddy, are you, are you going to find that little girl? When are you going to find that little girl? And, and I think that was a conversation that was occurring in the homes of dozens of investigators and police officers involved in this case. While the search continued, Gogan approached the nearby FBI lab with the evidence he had processed from the car. Because Melissa was still missing, the FBI's state-of-the-art technology would be critical in establishing the connection between the hair, fibers, and bloodstains collected and Hello, Melissa Brennan. Agent Doug Diedrich of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit would examine the evidence. Perhaps he could find a link to Melissa Brannon. There, you have to go to extraordinary measures to try to recreate, if at all possible, the environment of the victim, most recent environment, and also the types of hairs that the victim may have, the type of clothing that the victim may had, uh, may have been wearing the night of the disappearance. And that's, that's a difficult part. As long as Melissa was still missing, filing charges against Caleb Hughes was all but impossible unless compelling evidence could be found. Diedrich and the lab examiners were impressed by the large number of fibers that had transferred onto the passenger seat of Hughes's car. Fairfax County investigators had identified nearly 70 different fibers. That included the, the blue acrylic fibers, the red cotton fibers, the black rabbit hairs, and, and there were, uh, I believe, uh, one or two head hairs in the case. But that's monumental. Sounds like a small number. That's huge. Once the FBI entered the case, its agents conducted their own investigation of Hughes's house. When Caleb Hughes's name was released as the primary and only suspect in the case, a media frenzy followed. Hughes has not been charged in the case, but he is the target of round-the-clock surveillance by the FBI. Federal investigators working with police from Fairfax County last night executed a search warrant on the groundskeeper's rented townhouse. They recovered several items which have been taken to the FBI laboratory to be tested to see if there is any evidence linking this man to Melissa. In the meantime, the FBI's official comment is no comment. The FBI brought the power of a federal grand jury to the investigation. The grand jury ordered Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests, something the local authorities had not been able to order. Hughes complained bitterly in interviews that his life had been ruined by the invasion. Details of a troubled past emerged. Hughes grew up in an abusive, dysfunctional home. He had a record as a juvenile delinquent, a long history of drug and alcohol abuse, and a disturbing attraction toward children.
as an adult, he had been convicted of larceny. He had been convicted of car theft. Um, he had been convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The evidence indicated that he did spend a, uh, a lot of time with young children, nobody the age of, of Melissa Brannon, but certainly a, a, a lot of children in their early teens. In the lab, FBI examiners had begun analyzing the stains on the soles of Hughes's shoes. Though luminol testing had damaged the samples taken from Hughes's car, they became increasingly convinced that these minute traces contained blood serum proteins that could determine the crucial connection to Melissa. This blood's been... This the samples were submitted for DNA and serology tests. Fifteen days after Melissa's abduction, a candlelight vigil for Melissa was held at the apartment complex. The little girl's disappearance had united the Fairfax community in compassion and outrage. And during that whole Christmas season of 1989, that every night on the 6 o'clock news, she saw uh, the video shot that her grandfather had taken of, of Melissa Brannon. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I was like many, many people in the metropolitan area of Washington who felt that they knew her and from seeing this lovely child every night on television. But shortly after New Year's, a judge in the next county received a letter from Hughes's probation officer informing him that Hughes had violated probation for an auto theft conviction two years earlier. On January 24th, the judge revoked Hughes's probation and he was finally put behind bars. The earliest he could be released was November, giving the Fairfax County prosecutor ample time to build his case. Without sufficient evidence to file charges, Hughes had remained free. But now, with Hughes safely put away, the FBI had the time needed for the extensive testing required by the trace evidence. There was still a chance Melissa's body might be found. But without it, the case against Hughes would have to be made in the FBI lab. Already, FBI examiner Doug Diedrich had found his first big break in the case. I remembered some black animal hairs in the debris from the front seats of the car. And in looking through the little girl's nightshirt, I noticed these similar black hairs sticking out of, out of the nightshirt. So it just rang a bell. I went back, mounted those up on slides and compared them, and sure enough, dyed rabbit hair, and they matched each other. The rabbit hairs from Hughes's car and those found on Melissa's nightgown both revealed a distinctive corncob texturing, an exact microscopic match. Agent Diedrich immediately called the prosecutor to determine whether Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat. Not only was it confirmed that Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat, she had worn it to the Christmas party. Her mother had bought it in Germany, and it was dyed an extremely rare bluish-black color almost unknown in the United States. Melissa had handled the coat at the party and at home. Diedrich had made the crucial connection between Melissa and the car of Caleb Hughes. So you not only, you tied those rabbit hairs, you tied that match, not only to the fur coat of her mother, Peanuts, you them. tied it to the front seat of the car, but you also tied it to the child's environment itself, uh, the rabbit hairs on the, on the shirt of the child. To me, I, that was a significant point in the case, because then it starts pushing me in the direction of, we might have something. And, and from there, it was a matter of digging some more, to see if I couldn't find some additional fibers that may be of value. So I started digging a little bit more, started looking a little closer, asking questions of myself, asking questions of the evidence, because it's speaking. Strange, but it's speaking to me. As week after week passed, 
Melissa's name eventually disappeared from the news. Life in Fairfax County had returned to normal, but Tammy Brennan was still no closer to finding her child. It's tremendously difficult for the family to come to terms with everything that that has gone on to come to terms with, with still trying to hold on to that glimmer of hope that their child's alive, and then the realization that in all likelihood, you know, they may never find their child alive or may never find the body of their child, even after they've been murdered. Tammy was forced to face the reality that by now, there was almost no chance Melissa could still be alive. How did you do it? We wanted to close this case and, and not just close the case in the sense of identifying and prosecuting a suspect, but we wanted to bring real closure to the case in answering the question, what happened to Melissa Brandon that night? Why did it happen? Such questions plagued Tammy Brandon. Depressed and unable to work, she remained secluded in her apartment, waiting. Agent Diedrich had examined the blue acrylic and red cotton fibers in the passenger seat evidence collected by Jim Gogan. At first glance, they appeared to match descriptions he had been given of the red tights and big bird sweater Melissa wore that night. But without a duplicate outfit to make an exact fiber comparison, he was at a dead end. And so I went home, spoke to my wife, of course, she straightened me out right away that if it had a big bird on it, it wasn't Winnie the Pooh and it had to be sold to J.C. Penney's, having young kids of my own about the same age. Diedrich asked his wife if she kept any old J.C. Penney catalogs in the house from the last few years. She said she knew she had a Christmas catalog. Diedrich was astonished to find a picture of an outfit that exactly matched the description of that worn by Melissa. great. The FBI contacted J.C. Penney, and the store began a search of its records. For more than two months, Tammy Branham had anxiously waited by the phone for some kind of information or word about her daughter. Where is she? Then, completely unexpectedly, she received a phone call. A man's voice told her he was holding okay? Melissa for ransom and that she must deliver $75,000 the next day or her little girl would be seriously hurt. Can I talk to her? Had Melissa been found? Yes. Yes. The national statistics will tell you that a child who's abducted by a stranger is usually dead within three hours of the abduction. So the likelihood of Melissa being alive months after the abduction is extremely slim. Tammy immediately called her mother, but Detective Wilden cautioned them not to let their hopes get too high. No, no, don't, don't call anyone. I'll tell you all about it. Just come over right now. Once again, Melissa Brannon was okay. about to become front page news. Detective Wilden had instructed Tammy Brennan to cooperate with the ransom demands in the hopes her daughter would be recovered alive. As extortion falls under federal guidelines, the FBI coordinated the ransom drop. The FBI SWAT team was ready when two young men showed up in the parking lot to pick up the money. I see him getting ready to open up the door. We got the bag. Go. Here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were quickly arrested. But did they have Melissa in their possession? The information provided in the ransom call was so vague and so generalized, it's entirely possible that the, the, the person who called <clears throat> may have picked up that information simply by watching the news or reading the newspaper. Uh, usually if there's a ransom demand that is legitimate, they're going to have very specific information that would be known only to the abductor and probably some of the investigators. The two arrested youths were former students and roommates from a nearby university who had seen an opportunity to make some easy money out of Tammy Brannan's tragedy. 
They were convicted of five counts, including conspiracy and extortion in the United States District Court in Alexandria, Virginia. Turned out to be just a terrible hoax. I mean, just terrible. The, the, the notion that you would do that deliberately uh, to the, uh, a mother who was going through what she was going through. There were copious amounts of dog hairs in the tape samples collected by Fairfax County crime scene investigator Jim Gogan, as well as dozens of human hairs. FBI lab examiners separated and painstakingly subjected each one to testing. Finally, a hair was found that was different from the others. The hair was a very light blonde, the only one of its type found in the vehicle but it was an exact match with the hairs found in Melissa's hairbrush. Matching the human hair with Melissa was the second big match for Diedrich. But the critical link of Melissa's clothes to the fibers from Hughes's car was incomplete without a duplicate Big Bird outfit to analyze. Because it had been a special Christmas outfit, produced only once, it could not be found in stock. J.C. Penney gave the FBI a list of people who had purchased the outfit from its catalog division. They then sent FBI agents out across the country to locate those people and determine if they still had the Big Bird outfit that they had bought from the J.C. Penney catalog, and ultimately they were able to locate a sample outfit from a, a family that still had the outfit. Obtaining the outfit could mean the difference between conviction and acquittal in the case. The FBI asked the family traced through the J.C. Penney records to send it to their crime lab. Well, I remember that day pretty clearly. I, I knew the outfit was coming in. The fiber color, according to the color in the catalog, was navy blue. But the fibers that I was finding were sort of purplish blue. So I was a little anxious that maybe this wasn't the same outfit, that maybe we were going in the wrong direction. So when that package came, I was, again, un un you know, uncomfortable with even opening it, because I, was, I, w I thought I was on the right track, but I didn't, I didn't want to be wrong. Opened up the box, and sure enough, it had a purplish coloration to it. So it, it kind of gave me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling there that I might have the right color anyway. Fibers were pulled from the red cotton skirt and the blue acrylic sweater. A thorough analysis of the fibers from the outfit indicated an identical match with the fibers from Hughes's car. From the red cotton threads to the blue acrylic yarns to the yellow cross threads from the plaid skirt, the duplicate Big Bird outfit matched in every respect with the car fibers. What I was finding was meaningful evidence that an abduction had taken place and in fact, the victim, uh, in all likelihood, had been in the front seat of the subject's car. With the new evidence, the prosecution could now piece together the actions of Caleb Hughes on the night Melissa disappeared. At the party, Hughes had tried to pick up several adult women, but when they rejected him, he sought a substitute. Fueled by frustration and alcohol, Caleb Hughes became a desperate predator with a perverse desire. His stalking eye fell upon the children. He waited and watched until an opportunity presented itself. When it did, Caleb Hughes seized an innocent and trusting child. Hey, Melissa. Remember me? Come here. By abducting Melissa Brennan, Hughes had crossed the boundary into the unspeakable. We had to like
The analysis of the duplicate Big Bird outfit produced compelling evidence. It would be a powerful tool in the case against a man who investigators felt was a ruthless child molester and murderer. But Agent Diedrich had to convince the jury how incredibly unlikely it would be that these fibers had come from any source other than Melissa's outfit. He began asking people at the FBI to give him any items they may have made of navy blue acrylic. He collected more than a hundred. And the ob objective was to see, do the fibers that I found in the front seat of Cal Huscar, do they match any of these? The answer was no. From the items, Diedrich collected 126 different acrylic fibers. He made 7,983 comparison tests with those fibers against the ones found in Hughes's car. Out of almost 8,000 tests, only one succeeded in making an exact microscopic match with the blue acrylic fibers found in Hughes's car. And that was the duplicate Big Bird outfit. Whenever you match two things, it has a lot of significance. These aren't random events. These, in most cases, occur. Is it possible? You can't deny the possibility that it could be a coincidence. But after looking at this stuff for a lot of years, I'm not a big believer in coincidence. Three weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, as investigators made final preparations for the case, a stunning development occurred. They received a phone call. Two counties away, police had just found the body of a child on the median strip of Interstate 95. I'll be right there. I called Wilden. We got in his car, and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, that that's, that was going to be it, because Hughes uh, knew that area, spent time down in that area. I said, "Wow, this this is going to be it." That section of median on I-95 is wide and densely wooded. It would have been easy for Hughes to pull over, hide the body among the thick vegetation, and drive off unnoticed, and there would be little chance of someone finding the remains. But someone found a body. Was it Melissa's? If it was Melissa Brannon's body in the highway median, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan felt he could put Hughes behind bars on murder one charges. His hopes were high, but they were soon dashed. As soon as we got there, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't Melissa Brannon. It could, the skeleton had rings on three fingers, uh, but it was a young girl. She's um, 13, 12, 13, 14 year old, um, who had been in that media for two growing seasons. The young girl's body was never identified. Finally, nearly one year after Melissa's disappearance, Hughes was arrested on a grand jury indictment for abducting Melissa Brannan. He was transferred from the Prince William County Jail to the Fairfax County Jail. Moran had delayed the indictment for several months in the hope that Melissa's body would be found. By then, um, I know we were all pretty satisfied that the worst had happened to the child. Uh, unfortunately, under Virginia law, uh, you can charge somebody with murder uh, without the body, but you have to be able to prove where the murder occurred. And of course, without the body in this case, um, we had no way of proving where it occurred, so we couldn't charge him with murder. Abduction with intent to defile was the strongest case that could be brought against him. Hughes pleaded not guilty. Few people in Fairfax County believe that Melissa could still be alive, but everyone, most of all Tammy Brannan, needed to know what had happened and needed to see justice served. Because it's tremendously important that the family of that child have definitive answers, that they know what happened to their child, even if the news is not pleasant. They need to understand 
exactly with concrete information what happened to their child. They need to be able to have a closure. They need to be able to, to give that child the burial that they deserve and go on with their lives. With Agent Diedrich's airtight analysis of the trace evidence, Robert Horan went into the trial confident right, that he could second. convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt. The trial began on February 26, 1991. Looking good. A chief part of Horan's strategy is depicting Hugh's deviant sexual behavior at the party. He produced several female witnesses who recalled the crude, vulgar sexual propositions he had made to them and others who testified he had spent considerable time playing with Melissa and had been talking to her just before she disappeared. His behavior was even more extreme, trying to eliminate the evidence. Washing his clothes, his leather belt, his shoes. He could not account for the fresh cuts on the soles of his shoes. Nor could he account for his whereabouts for the two and a half hours between leaving the party and arriving home. But the problem for the defense is somehow you had to explain that time. And, and, and there was never an explanation. I mean, it would have gutted our case. Our case is over if you can explain any of that time. Though tests for blood on the shoes had proved inconclusive, the prosecution was now able to show the jury the exact matches made between the rabbit hairs, the head hair, and the fibers found in Hughes's car. Nonetheless, the defense argued that all of the fiber and hair evidence was purely circumstantial. It may be circumstantial, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence because it doesn't change. In order to obtain the maximum sentence for Hughes, Moran needed to convince the jury that Hughes had intended to defile Melissa once he had her in his car. And the only way the fibers from her outfit would have been found on the seat is that her, car, her coat had been removed while she was in that car. The prosecution charged that Hughes could only have removed Melissa's coat for one purpose, an attempt to defile. The true answer is that that five-year-old was seated against her will in the front seat of that vehicle. Caleb Hughes's trial lasted eight days. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of abducting Melissa Brannan with intent to defile. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. For the family members, it can't end because of the eternal hope, if you will, that someday this child that's never been seen, never been found, this child someday will, will appear. And that's, that's hard stuff. That is hard stuff. Caleb Hughes is still serving his sentence today, and the body of Melissa Brannan has never been found. Eventually, Tammy Brannan moved from a Woodside apartment complex, but she never changed the telephone number that Melissa had memorized by heart, hoping that one day a call might come. For nearly two decades, a mathematical genius with delusions of single-handedly destroying industrial society planted or mailed powerful bombs to unsuspecting innocent victims. It was a spree of mayhem that killed three and wounded over two dozen. In the largest and most expensive investigation in FBI history, agents spent 17 years hunting for the elusive terrorist known as the Unabomber. The first bomb came in the spring of 1978. The damage it caused was minimal, but its impact would be enormous. With each new detonation, the bomber learned a little more about bombs. 
and law enforcement learned a little more about the man who sent them. Because its targets were universities and airlines, the FBI called him the Unabomber. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Before we ever knew the name Ted Kaczynski, we knew we were dealing with a disgruntled genius. We just didn't know how smart or how angry he truly was, or how far he'd go. But while the Unabomber was carefully perfecting his bombs, we were refining our profile. It was all a matter of who would finish first. On May 25th, 1978, an engineering professor named Buckley Christ at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, appeared in the mailroom with a shoebox-sized parcel. Professor Christ was listed as the return addressee, and he didn't know the man it was addressed to. Campus security guard Terry Marker cracked, maybe it's a bomb. As bombs go, it wasn't much of one. It began a 20-year streak of violence that would stump the FBI and terrorize the nation. On November 15, 1979, American Airlines Flight 444 took off from Chicago, bound for Washington, D.C. As the Boeing 727 reached cruising altitude, the cabin filled with smoke. It was pandemonium. The plane was diverted to Dulles Airport in Virginia. A dozen people were treated for smoke inhalation. But for a faulty wire in the bomb, over a hundred people would have been killed. Bombing an airliner is a federal offense. The FBI was called in. FBI agent Chris Ronay examined the evidence of the airline bomb. It essentially was a wooden box that looked uh, to be hand uh, fashioned, handmade. We found that it contained a uh, barometric switch and uh, some other uh, initiating components, batteries, wires, and uh, a container for the explosive charge. The barometric switch would function when the pressure changed in the baggage compartment sufficiently to close the switch or allow the barometric switch to function and then actually detonate the bomb. The use of an altitude sensitive barometric switch told the FBI that they were dealing with a serious and smart bomber. Rone began his inquiries with the Chicago police. He was looking for anything to compare to the airline device. At Northwestern University, a thorough search uncovered the existence of two minor and seemingly unrelated incidents at the university. In addition to learning of the device that injured Terry Marker, Ronay learned of another. On May 9, 1979, another bomb had gone off at Northwestern University, seriously injuring graduate student John Harris. Its design was nearly identical to the first one. But since they were both relatively minor incidents, authorities at the time didn't connect the two. Dismissing those devices as amateurish pranks, the recovered debris was discarded. Working only from photographs, Chris Rone concluded that all three bombs were the work of the same person. There were construction techniques, the way the wood was cut, the way it was put together, the markings on the wood, the way the tape was applied, that is evident in the photographs, was the same as in the previous cases. The pipe bombs placed inside wooden boxes were all made of ordinary components, screws and nails and smokeless powder and black tape. The components were homemade and sanded to render them untraceable. Certain components were not crafted as much as fondled and played with and looked at and you could see they were handled and shaped and reshaped and it just struck me that somebody spent an awful lot of time on this bomb uh, enjoying putting it together. The FBI realized 
they were dealing with a serial bomber, one that was passionate about his craft. In the 1950s, a shy, highly intelligent boy from suburban Illinois named Ted Kaczynski skipped a grade in elementary school. He was an introvert, preferring to withdraw into his room to study, especially to study chemistry. He was a prodigy with genius level intelligence. His IQ topped 170. He entered Harvard at 16 and graduated in three years in 1962. In five years, he had received his doctorate from the University of Michigan. As an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley, Kaczynski was not a popular or outgoing professor. Practically no one got to know him. In 1969, he abruptly resigned. The social nature of his teaching position was too much for Ted. He just didn't seem to fit in. By 1971, Kaczynski had decided to drop out of society completely. He bought an acre and a half of land in a rural area just outside of Lincoln, Montana, 6,000 feet above the society he had come to despise. He built a tiny 8 by 10 foot cabin with no electricity or running water. There he would sit by himself, reading and writing. One of the things Ted wrote was a 23-page essay raging against modern man's obsession with technological and scientific progress. Scientific research, he wrote, will inevitably result in the extinction of individual liberty. He sent a copy to his brother, David. David read it and stuck it in a trunk where it sat for a quarter of a century. In June of 1978, Ted Kaczynski took a time out from his cabin to take a job working for his brother at a foam cutting plant in Illinois. Ted's bizarre behavior became too much. His brother was forced to fire him. Ted had insulted a female co-worker who had refused his advances. Ted seethed and within a year moved back to his cabin in Montana, vowing never to see his family again. Trying to fit in as a social being was too frustrating for the introverted genius. Ted withdrew even more, believing modern man incapable of understanding him. He was starting to see civil society as an obstacle that needed to be overcome. In time, Ted became acclimated to his life with few luxuries. He took it upon himself to grow his own food and to be otherwise self-sufficient. He had few acquaintances, opting for his own company in the Montana wilds. Ted rarely made it into Lincoln. When he did, it was usually to bury his face in reference books in the small town library. On May 3, 1980, Ted Kaczynski rode his homemade bike into Lincoln. He wasn't going to the library this time. Instead, he caught a bus for Helena and checked into the Helena Park Hotel for a brief stay. The next day, he headed west. Ted had urgent business that needed tending to. Percy Wood, the president of United Airlines, received a parcel at his suburban Chicago home on June 10th, 1980. A few days earlier, he received a letter from a stranger promising to mail him a book which the letter said had tremendous social significance.
Wood placed the package on his kitchen counter. He opened and retrieved a book, Ice Brothers, by Sloan Wilson. Wood was puzzled. Why is this book socially significant? He opened the cover. Wood was nearly killed. The bomber had upped the ante considerably with his fourth and most powerful device yet. FBI and ATF bomb technicians poured over the scene. It was quickly identified as the work of the serial bomber. Each bomb so far had been a pipe bomb with similar construction and wiring. On this, the fourth bomb, the bomber had left a calling card. Punched into a piece of rubble were the letters FC. Certainly, the initials FC were put in these bombs to be found, clearly protected in such a way that they would survive the blasts. Uh, it didn't make any sense to have it in there. It didn't function any, in any way. It served no purpose except to say, here's my, uh, my signature. Here's an identifying feature. The FBI could only speculate what FC meant. By this time, FBI investigators had already given him a name. He bombed universities and airlines. They called him Unibomb, UN for university and A for airline. Naming him was easy. Finding him would be much, much more difficult. In 1981, with FC their best clue yet, the FBI cross-referenced thousands of people with those initials. But the Unabomber was not sitting idle. In October, a package was found sitting in a building at the University of Utah. It was a pipe bomb. Fortunately, it was a dud. Investigators now had a device intact. Perhaps a component was traceable. It would take time to find out. The Unabomber remained busy. In the spring of 1982, a package meant for Professor Leroy Wood Berenson blew up instead in the hands of an academic assistant at Vanderbilt University. The bomb was made of the usual materials, with the initials FC on the surviving wreckage. Examiners spent endless hours studying every minute detail of the Unibomb devices. The most bizarre clues suddenly emerged. The last two people specifically targeted were named Wood. Wood played such an important role in every one of the bombs. I mean, it was present in every one of the bombs, even when it didn't need to be. He, in fact, if, if he didn't have wood and he threw wood in it, sticks of wood just so they'd be there. There were references to wood in addresses and names of people throughout. FBI lab examiner Doug Diedrich of the Trace Evidence Unit is also a wood expert. Well, the materials may indicate something about that individual. It may indicate where he might live, what he might do for a living. And that's one of the things that I was involved with, especially in trying to determine where these types of woods came from, uh, what geographical area, what part of the country. This approach seemed like a long shot, but the scarcity of clues left investigators with few options. As the FBI investigation intensified, so did the power of the Unabomber's devices. On July 2nd, 1982, Professor Diogenes Angelakos of the University of California, Berkeley, a devoted husband and a popular teacher, noticed a strange-looking object on the floor of the computer science department's coffee room. The explosion seriously wounded him and tore off his fingers. As he lay dazed, he found a typewritten note. Woo, it works. 
I told you it would. RV. The FBI ran down everyone in America named Wu, and everyone with the initials RV, a monumental, labor-intensive task, but to no avail. The note was a ruse. Another lead surfaced the day following the blast. A custodian who worked in Corey Hall, the building where the bomb exploded, saw a man with a thin mustache and sweatshirt loitering in the hall the night before. The custodian, however, was unable to remember enough details to help a sketch artist make a composite. Angelakos was critically wounded, requiring a lengthy hospital stay. He was no longer able to care for his invalid wife. She died within a month of the blast. In May of 1985, in that same building, Berkeley graduate student John Hauser, a captain in the Air Force, noticed on the floor a three-ring binder sitting on top of another object. Hauser had just applied for astronaut training. What he didn't know as he lay wounded was that he had already been accepted into the program, but he would never fly again. His Air Force Academy ring was found embedded in the wall across the room. Ironically, Professor Angelakos was nearby when the bomb exploded. He rushed to help Hauser. Unabomb-related crime scene investigations conducted by the FBI, ATF, and the United States Postal Service had become frustratingly routine. The recovered bomb components were packaged and sent to the FBI lab for future comparisons. Over the next few years, there would be many such examinations. On May 8, 1985, a package was received at the Boeing Corporation in Auburn, Washington. It was addressed only to the company, was heavy, and had too much postage. A suspicious mailroom employee called security. The package was x-rayed and shown to contain a pipe bomb. It had FC stamped into the end caps. Had the employee opened the package, it most likely would have killed him and anyone else nearby. On November 15, 1985, Dr. James McConnell, a psychology professor at the University of Michigan, received a letter and package from a Ralph C. Kloppenberg. The sender described himself as a doctoral student. I'd like you to read this book, he wrote. Everyone in your position should read this book. As he read, his assistant opened the package nearby. The explosion seriously injured the assistant and blew out the hearing of Dr. McConnell. Examiners continued to dissect the bombs. They were evolving as the Unabomber refined his craft. Exhaustive lab tests showed they were getting more sophisticated and more powerful. Agents were frustrated. They were making little progress in determining the identity of the Unabomber. And their analysis was confirming what they already knew. If the packages kept coming, it would only be a matter of time before someone was killed. Hugh Scrutton owned the Rentec computer store in Sacramento, California. On December 11, 1985, about lunchtime, Scrutton headed out the back door that led to the rear parking lot when he noticed something. It looked like a block of wood with four nails sticking out points up. The explosion was ferocious, blowing a massive gaping hole into Scruton's chest, exposing his heart. The Unabomber was now a murderer. 
The bomb that killed Hugh Scruton was the most powerful yet. It consisted of a pipe within a pipe and contained all of the same characteristics as the others, right down to the FC stamped on a surviving end cap. The Unabomber investigation was now officially a homicide case. Investigators stuck to their strategy of keeping the details of the case secret, lest the Unabomber learn what they knew, or worse, lest they encourage copycats. Agents were desperate for a solid lead. Ted Kaczynski was always active in his secluded cabin. When he wasn't making bombs, he was writing his philosophy that justified them. For Ted Kaczynski, technological society was a horror, defined by the Earth's destruction and human beings amounting to little more than mindless robots. In Ted's story, anyone who was participating in the human race's dependency on technology was a villain. On February 20th, 1987, a secretary at Cam's computer store in Salt Lake City looked out of her office window and caught a glimpse of a man in the parking lot placing an object on the ground. An hour later, the store's owner, Gary Wright, was in the parking lot. He noticed the object on the ground. It was a block of wood with four nails sticking out, points up. Wright received serious injuries, but miraculously survived. As police scoured bus stations and local businesses looking for a suspect, a sketch was commissioned from the secretary's description. It was unquestionably the portrait of a man in disguise. The sketch didn't catch the Unabomber, but in one way it may have worked. Knowing he was seen, the Unabomber seemed to vanish. After nine years of bombings, Unabomber-related incidents simply stopped after the 1987 CAMS explosion. The investigation had continued, but all available leads had been exhausted. After six years of silence, investigators were hopeful that the Unabomber had either been imprisoned on some unrelated charge or died. Either way, the bombs had stopped. But Ted Kaczynski was neither dead nor in jail. He had spent the last six years virtually alone. Content in his day-to-day -day routine, tending the garden, hunting, writing, and visiting the library, Ted always managed to stay on top of current events. In 1993, after a six-year hiatus, several highly publicized events propelled the Unabomber out of retirement. The fiery siege at Waco, Texas, between the ATF and the Branch Davidian religious cult, and the bombing of the World Trade Center, created a violent political environment. The Unabomber would return in a fit of violence of his own. Dr. Charles Epstein is a renowned geneticist at the University of San Francisco. On June 22nd, 1993, he sat down at his kitchen table to open his mail including a padded envelope which had arrived that day. The blast critically injured Dr. Epstein. After two and a half hours of surgery, he was stabilized and very lucky to be alive. Two days later, on June 24th, Dr. David Galerter, a prominent computer scientist at Yale University, arrived early at his office to open his mail from the previous day. Injured in his right arm, help. eye, and abdomen, Galerter struggled to his feet and went out the door for help.
The FBI quickly determined that the Epstein bomb and the Galerter bomb were identical. Pipe bombs filled with potassium chlorate and aluminum powder. Both devices had been placed inside a handcrafted wooden box. A few hours after the Galerter bomb went off, a letter was received in the mailroom of the New York Times. It was from a self-proclaimed anarchist group called FC, who were claiming responsibility for the recent bombings. FC promised more communications in the future. An identifying number was provided to the Times to ensure the authenticity of future communications. It was 553-25-4394. The FBI determined that the number was a social security number of a 20-year-old parolee in Northern California, incredibly with a tattoo on his arm reading pure wood. An investigation quickly dismissed him as the Unabomber. Another major clue was discovered. Impressed into the paper on the New York Times letter was the faint notation, Call Nathan R. Wednesday, 7 p.m. The elusive Unabomber finally provided agents with a solid lead. The FBI talked to over 10,000 people whose first name was Nathan and whose last name began with R. The exhaustive search turned up nothing. It seemed the Unabomber loved sending the FBI on wild goose chases. The Times ran the letter, which sparked public interest. It also drew the FBI into dozens of false leads disgruntled students, aircraft engineers, even a Dungeons and Dragons club in Chicago. The latest round of activity had sent the FBI investigation into overdrive. A Unabomb task force consisting of FBI, ATF, and postal inspectors was formed to coordinate investigative efforts. Jim Freeman was the head of the FBI's San Francisco field office. He would also head the multi-agency Unibomb task force. We had evidence that was scattered around three different federal agencies and a lot of local state uh, laboratories. So we recognized that uh, our task was to, was to gain control of the information that was already out there, determine what investigation had already been, been done. And we set about this by deciding to reinvestigate every Unibomb crime. Every shred of physical evidence that remained from past Unibomber devices would be given to one forensic examiner, Special Agent Tom Monell of the FBI Laboratory's Materials and Devices Unit became the chief examiner for the investigation. All the evidence in the Unibomb case, no matter if it was explosive related or not, came through me and my unit. In a serial bombing type case such as the Unibomb case, the most frustrating aspect was the fact that we were doing all forensic examinations that could possibly be done to the evidence and it wasn't able to lead us to any individual. While the task force struggled, Kaczynski's warped revolution against society continued. On December 10, 1994, Advertising executive Thomas Moser was opening his mail in his North Caldwell, New Jersey home. His wife and two daughters were upstairs. He examined a small package with excessive postage from an H.C. Wickle, Department of Economics, San Francisco State University. The explosion was the most gruesome yet, instantly decapitating Thomas Moser. With every previous device in the Unabomber investigation, Agent Monell was able to reconstruct a replica, working only from the debris recovered from the various crime scenes. As with the 15 bombs he had reconstructed, this one was unquestionably the work of the Unabomber. A few months later, Ted Kaczynski prepared for an extended visit to the West Coast. This trip would be his busiest to date. On April 19, 1995, Ted Kaczynski was in the San Francisco Bay Area when Timothy McVeigh's 2,000-pound fuel oil bomb destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people. 
Ted would not let his agenda be eclipsed by the devastation in Oklahoma. The next day, April 20th, the nation still reeling over Oklahoma City, Kaczynski mailed five items, four letters, and a parcel. Within a few days, the mail arrived back east. First was a letter to the New York Times. FBI Special Agent Terry Turchi was second in command of the Unabom Task Force. In the letter to the New York Times, he mentioned that uh, he was claiming responsibility for the attacks on Thomas Moser, Charles Epstein, and David Galanter. He also mentioned some of his uh, goals and objectives and said that he was thinking of sending a manuscript or an essay and that he wanted them to consider publishing that essay. And if they did, he would make an agreement to cease committing terrorist acts. The second letter received was to recent victim David Galanter at Yale, still recovering from his April wounding. The letter was taunting. Dr. Galanter, people with advanced degrees are not as smart as they think they are. If you'd had any brains, you would have realized that there are a lot of people out there who resent bitterly the way techno nerds like you are changing the world. On April 25, 1995, a package arrived at the California Forestry Association addressed to its former president, William Dennison. Its current president, Gilbert Murray, decided to open it himself. It exploded with incredible violence, destroying everything in the office. Gil Murray was literally blown to pieces. Four blocks away, the governor of California heard the blast from his office. The Unabomb scare was nationwide. Bomb threats were being reported everywhere. The FBI suspect list topped 50,000 names. 16 years and 16 bombs later, the Unabomber had claimed three lives and injured two dozen people. Two months after Murray was brutally killed, a letter arrived at the San Francisco Chronicle. It read, the terrorist group FC, called Unabomb by the FBI, is planning to blow up an airliner out of Los Angeles International Airport during the next six days. The threat had to be taken absolutely seriously because the Unabomber had in fact placed a, a bomb aboard an aircraft before. It wasn't lethal enough to blow the plane out of the sky, but we knew that, that his bomb making ability had progressed enough that he certainly was capable of that now. The FBI saw to it that special security measures went into effect immediately at California airports. No one without a ticket was allowed through security. All bags were searched. Bomb sniffing dogs checked everything. The Postal Service stopped flying the mail on commercial jets. Passengers are questioned about carry on luggage that they've had. Uh, have you? had this package in your custody and control during the entire time? Uh, did, you pack, did you pack the uh, suitcase yourself? Those type of questions all began from that day in LAX. The same day that the airliner threat was received at the San Francisco Chronicle, the Washington Post received a message from FC, a 56-page typed manifesto. The New York Times received a carbon copy of the manifesto the next day as did the adult magazine Penthouse two days after that. The letter to the Post and Times laid out the terms and conditions for publication and agreed to stop the bombings if the Post or the Times published. For Special Agent Terry Turchi and the Unabomb Task Force, receiving the manifesto was a huge break. Of course, when the Unabomb manuscript came in, that was big information and this was a, a major break and we all knew that it was a major break which if handled properly could possibly lead us to identify the Unabomber. The manuscript blandly titled Industrial Society and Its Consequences was a meticulously written tract against technology, genetics, leftism, conservatism and modern society generally. The FBI had many items of evidence collected from years of investigating this case. They needed to generate just one solid lead, one 
that could hopefully break the case wide open. Freeman thought the answer lay in publishing the manifesto. We very much were in favor of, of publishing it because after reading the manifesto, it was clear that someone had, uh, had put their philosophy that had evolved over a number of years within the pages of this thing. Uh, it was recognizable. Somebody in reading this, we hoped, would, would read it and say, I remember that guy. He was uh, sat next to me in class uh, at uh, such and such a university. The FBI is After some public soul searching and discussions with the director of the FBI and Attorney General Janet Reno, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, the decision was made to publish the manifesto. The manifesto appeared in a special section of the Post on September 19, 1995. By early 1996, Ted Kaczynski's brother David had been doing some soul-searching of his own. The news reports that the Unabomber had connections to Chicago, their boyhood home, as well as to Berkeley and Salt Lake City, nagged at him. He got a copy of the manifesto and began reading. He read it in the hopes of erasing the idea that his brother was a killer. What he read sent chills down his spine. He recognized the language and content of the manifesto as being similar to that of writings by his brother Ted. David dug up as many old letters and writings of Ted's as he could find and compared them to the Unabomber manifesto. Both had employed the unique phrase cool-headed logician. David was distressed, but not yet convinced. He wrote Ted an urgent letter. Though he did not reveal his suspicions, he requested a visit to Montana. Ted refused his brother's request. David decided to call a private investigator to look into the matter but the news that the private eye brought him was not encouraging. The private eye submitted the manifesto along with some of Ted's writing to be analyzed by experts who didn't know the parties involved. The experts concluded that the authors had a strong chance of being the same person. Frantically, David continued his search for anything Ted had ever written to him. In an old trunk, he came across the essay Ted had sent him back in 1971. David could no longer hide from the reality that his brother might be the Unabomber. David Kaczynski was stunned. The 1971 essay David had unearthed was eerily similar to the Unabomber manifesto. Torn by the prospect of turning in his own brother on the one hand and endangering lives on the other, David Kaczynski made a gut-wrenching decision. Through his attorney, he contacted the FBI about his brother. In February of 1996, David Kaczynski told task force members of his suspicions. He gave a detailed accounting of Ted's life, where he grew up, where he went to school, and where he now lived. He then turned over the 1971 essay. And then we were able to do a side-by-side -side comparison between that document that uh, was prepared many years before to a, the current uh, copy of the manifesto, and it was uh, very clear to us, uh, many of us in the task force, that, that the similarities were more than coincidental. The FBI analyzed the essay and found over 160 examples of similarities with the Unabomber Manifesto, including common phrases and misspellings. The list went on and on. After 17 years, the FBI had its first major suspect, Ted Kaczynski. Dozens of FBI agents quietly slipped into the small town of Lincoln, Montana. The FBI kept careful surveillance on Kaczynski's cabin as they laid out the case for a search warrant, hoping that the Unabomber would not strike again in the interim. By the beginning of April, enough information had been uncovered to justify the warrant.
Among other things, agents were able to learn that Ted had traveled extensively. Hotel records showed that he was always on the move immediately preceding a Unabomber event. Agent Terry Turchie submitted a meticulous 65-page affidavit outlining the government's case against Ted Kaczynski and requesting permission to search his cabin. We had been working all morning since about 5 that morning to pre-position various agent teams in different locations in the woods in Lincoln, Montana and at a forward command post that we had established in Lincoln. Everybody had a different role. We had also had the evidence response teams coming in and they were staging at a, another command post that we had in Lincoln. So everyone was ready to go once the warrant was signed. Disguised FBI agents and a forest officer approached Kaczynski's cabin. They walked toward his cabin speaking loudly. They didn't want Kaczynski to suspect there was anybody sneaking up on him. The officers asked him to help identify a property line on their map. As he turned to get his coat, the officers pounced on Kaczynski. The suspected Unabomber was in custody. Kaczynski was immediately taken for questioning to a temporary forward command post. Jim Freeman was about to come face to face with the man that had eluded the FBI for nearly two decades. He looked just absolutely disheveled. Uh, he, he looked like he was covered with soot. Uh, the agents that had, had grabbed his arms to, uh, uh, to restrain him had soot on their hands. So, Ted, you like to travel? Kaczynski admitted nothing and refused to say whether the cabin had any live bombs in it. As the questioning continued, the search of the cabin began. The tiny cabin was treated essentially like a live bomb. It was assumed that the place at the very least had live bombs in it, or at worst, was heavily booby-trapped. Explosive ordnance disposal teams cautiously made their way into the cabin. Ted Kaczynski had not been formally arrested on any charges yet. As investigators searched through his cabin, they found enough evidence to charge him with possession of bomb-making materials. They found pipes, chemicals, wiring, batteries, and wooden boxes. This charge would allow agents to hold Kaczynski until a more thorough search could be conducted. FBI special agent and explosive expert Donald Sockleben was responsible for quickly gathering evidence in order to obtain the arrest warrant. He rushed to Helena to petition the judge. Sockleben had been working on the Unabomb case for years. I think it was on the ride back to Helena that night when Pat Webb and I, who had worked on this for so many years, just sort of looked at each other and realized that maybe this was the beginning of the end, uh, that we really did believe that night, if we hadn't believed before, that we had, in fact, caught the Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski was detained overnight until formal arrest charges could be brought the following morning. He was led through the streets on national television, looking every bit the part of an eccentric hermit. He was presented the next day before a judge in Helena on a charge of possession of bomb-making equipment. The search of the cabin continued. The room was a gold mine, but a dangerous one. Each container, each book, each binder needed to be x-rayed for explosive devices. It was clearly going to take a long time to search the tiny cabin. The evidence being slowly hauled out of the cabin was damning. A series of three ring binders with page after page of detailed bomb designs which matched the bombs used in many of the Unabomb explosions. Explosive powders of the type used in the bombings. Aluminum ingots and aluminum shavings on the floor, crucial bomb components. There was the infamous hooded sweatshirt and sunglasses. Agent Thomas Monell, the expert on Unabomb devices, was also inside the cabin. 
The other evidence located in the cabin were electrical components and wire that were consistent with the majority of the Unibomb devices. We found a improvised or a homemade flip type switch that was literally identical to three switches that were used in earlier bombs. After almost two full days, the search came to a sudden stop. A package was found. It was wrapped like previous bombs with a return address on it. All it awaited was a victim's name and address for the front. It was x-rayed and determined to be a live pipe bomb. Special Agent Sockleben had to handle the crisis. Well, from the x-ray, it looked very similar to the last bomb that had been placed, the one that killed Mr. Murray in Sacramento. We were able to safely remove the box from the cabin and take it down the hill to where we set up a site to deal with the bomb. The search slowly continued in the days ahead, and more and more damning evidence was seized. In addition to bomb-making paraphernalia and chemicals, agents also seized letters, notes, diagrams, and the Unabomber Manifesto. One irrefutable link between Ted Kaczynski and the Unabomber remained, the typewriter used for the manifesto. The typewriter that had uh, been used to type the manifesto wasn't found until literally the last day of the search, which took four or five days. It was literally in the, la the bottom of the last box that was, uh, that was opened. It had taken 11 days to search an 80-square-foot room, but the FBI's careful approach had paid off. The man who had killed, maimed, and ruined lives, all the while taunting the FBI, was caught stone cold. On April 14th, the entire cabin was hoisted onto a flatbed and hauled away for further examination. The charges against Kaczynski had been upgraded. On June 18, 1996, Ted Kaczynski was indicted in Sacramento on 10 counts relating to Unabomber activities. One charge in the death of Hugh Scruton, three charges in the wounding of Charles Epstein, three charges in the maiming of David Gilerter, and three charges in the death of Gil Murray. That day would have been Gil Murray's 48th birthday. New Jersey authorities filed more charges for the death of Thomas Moser. On November 12, 1996, selected visitors filed into a Sacramento courtroom for the long-awaited trial of Ted Kaczynski. In the front row was Ted's family, brother David, and his mother, Wanda Kaczynski. As Ted entered the courtroom, he turned his back angrily on his family members and never acknowledged them. Opening statements were about to begin when Kaczynski stood up and said he wanted to change lawyers. After a few days, the judge ruled that Kaczynski would have to undergo psychological testing. Federal prison psychiatrist Dr. Sally Johnson spent many days with Kaczynski. She concluded that Ted Kaczynski was mentally ill but was competent to stand trial. The government's case against Kaczynski was overwhelming. For 17 years, the Ice FBI brothers, had Ice prepared for this day. Examiners had reconstructed and preserved every device related to the Unabomber's crimes. With Ted Kaczynski's arrest, they were now able to establish an irrefutable link between him and the Unabomber. Ted's desire for solitude would no longer be self-imposed. With no options, he pled guilty to all Unabom-related crimes. He was given four life sentences plus 30 years. He would never be eligible for parole. For Agent Terry Turchi, the Unabom investigation shows the FBI's determination to never quit until justice is served, no matter how long it takes. For the people committing these crimes, who may go on for many years and not get caught, uh, they may become more arrogant, or they may become more complacent, or they may think we're never going to catch them. But I think for them and for the public, uh, the message has to be that we don't give up, and that we're going to stay with it until we solve it. And uh, certainly I think that is what uh, we're called upon to do and what we need to do. In June 1998, Joanna Lee, 
and assistant editor at Simon & Schuster Publishing, received a letter from Ted Kaczynski with a prison return address. She knew he was the convicted Unabomber, but opened it anyway. Kaczynski wanted them to publish a book about his struggle. To this date, there are no takers.